Well, welcome everyone. My name is Emily. I'm an agriforester with Appalachian Sustainable Development. Stesha Warren is also here. You want to say hello, Stesha? Hello, everyone. I'm an agroforester with Appalachian Sustainable Development, working tech, tech side here. And Sean, would you like to just say a little, little hoot and holler before we get started? Sure. Yeah. My name is Sean Dombrowski, and I am a uh, permaculture nursery operator up in the Finger Lakes area of New York State. Uh, it's a project called Edible Acres, and I look forward to sharing notes this evening, uh, specifically in the realm of growing trees from seed and how we approach that through a permaculture lens. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to share my screen for a minute and talk a little bit about where we're headed this evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about propagating trees from seed with Sean Dombrowski. Sean is a wealth of information and, uh, you know, if we stray a little bit, no one's going to be, be upset about that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. But first, just a little bit about ASD, and then we'll get into the guest presentation. And then the majority of our time tonight is actually going to be Q&A. So we've collected questions ahead of time. So thanks for everybody who submitted those. And then we've also got time for a live Q&A at the end. So as we're going through things tonight, feel free to be curating some questions to share because that's always super fun to listen to. All right, uh, Zoom logistics. If you are unfamiliar, there is closed captioning available at the bottom of the screen. If you click the CC icon, um, it'll pop up and give you language options and all kinds of cool stuff. This can be a really great feature, even if you're just in a loud space and you can't like turn things up all the way. So I encourage you to play around with that if you'd like to. And you can also take the, the little texts and move them around your screen to uh, get better placements. So that's a great feature. Um, you'll see at the bottom, I've got participants circled, but I realize that's not something that you actually have. So ignore that. Um, the Q&A is there. That's where we're going to be fielding questions from y'all. So you can put questions into that anytime tonight as they arise. And the way that works, other participants can also like upvote your questions with a little thumbs up so we can see um, like, hey, I also have that question. Or if someone has resources to share or, you know, links to drop, you could do that in the Q&A too. And that'll all be kind of located in one space. And then the chat is there really for, um, Stesha will be dropping some links tonight so that you can access those. Um, that's really just like the chat space. We're not going to monitor that for questions. So if you wanna just have a fun conversation, do that in the chat. If you want to ask some pointed questions, do that in the Q&A. And then during the live questioning part at the end, if you wanna do the little raise hand icon, it'll pop up a little raise hand like that and we will see it and we can unmute you so that you can ask a question by voice if you would like to do that. All right, just a little bit about ASD. Our mission is to build a thriving regional food and agriculture system that creates healthy communities, respects the planet and cultivates profitable opportunities for Appalachians. So I was just telling Sean before this, I always get a little bit nervous when I'm talking about ASD and our mission because, um, and our programming specifically, because we do a lot here. Um, and even in this slide, you can see all of the different program op operate options, options is the word I'm looking for <laughs> on our website. There's so much information here. So definitely check it out, especially if you're in Appalachia, we've got great resources. But most of what I'm talking about in the next minute or two is under the agroforestry uh, section of this tab. So if you click into agroforestry, you can find all this stuff. With the exception of the herb hub, you can see that's like the third option down. It's its own separate programming. So to start off, we've got a pretty robust technical assistance program in the uh, world of agroforestry. You can go onto our website, scroll down to the technical assistance section and fill out a application that takes maybe five minutes. It's free. Um, we provide free assistance in the areas of forest farming, alley cropping and silvopasture. And sometimes that can be a phone call or um, even just a resource share if you're really new to this stuff and you just need someone to point you in the right direction. We can connect producers to other producers and uh, we can do all kinds of stuff. And sometimes we can even make it work to have a site visit with you. So definitely check that out if you're curious about any of those practices and you're a land manager. 
We also have a newer program, the Maple Woodlot Assessment. And this is for folks who are looking to get into maple syruping in Appalachia and just aren't quite sure how to start. So uh, you can apply for both of those on the agroforestry page. Another program we have coming up is with the other Edwards Mother Earth Foundation grant that we are a partner on. We're working with Savannah Institute and Interlace Commons and Tech and Parnell. Um, so there's some big uh, heavy hitting players that are a part of this program and it's gonna be really great. It's really geared towards natural resource professionals. So anyone who's teaching this kind of stuff doesn't mean you have to you know, be a federal employee, it just means someone who's like in the business of teaching this kind of stuff. Um, if you are looking for deeper information, we all know there's a lot of high level information about these topics out there. What we found is it's hard to get this deeper information to really um, tell folks how to put these practices into play on the ground. What, what are those details? So if you're looking for that detailed information, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, the courses are online and then there are also workshops and field days. We're putting in demonstration sites. So if you scroll down on the webpage to the train the trainer program area, you can sign up for alerts for this. That's not putting you in any sort of um, newsletter or anything. It's just the alerts for just this program and you can make sure that you're in the loop of this. So definitely check that out. It's coming soon. And then the Appalachian Herb Hub. We've got some really neat stuff going on here. We do trainings, cost shares. Uh, we help folks process and market their herbs so that small herb growers can get to bigger markets and that they can also access equipment to help them get their herbs processed for sale in those markets. So if you're an herb grower, specifically if you're an herb grower within three hours of Duffield, Virginia, that's probably what uh, about the radius that makes financial sense for folks. Definitely check this out. Um, we've got lots of great resources for you there. And then we've got more agroforestry webinars coming up soon. So we've got a silver pasture on a shoestring uh, with Austin Unruh, where we're gonna be talking about getting started on the cheap. If this webinar is interesting to you, you're probably also gonna really appreciate Wildly Homegrown with Jonathan McRae, where he's talking about their small nursery operation and their approach to selection and seed sourcing and storytelling. We've got a live consultation coming up with I Eliza Greenman, who's uh, germplasm and uh, agroforestry superstar. Definitely check that out if that's interesting to you. And then we're closing up with Mark Krawcheck getting started in coppice agroforestry. So these are all gonna be super fun. We hope to see you again. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I just wanna share for a minute for folks that for folks that don't know Sean, I don't know Sean well. I approached him and he very graciously said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll be on a webinar with you, uh, for you. And so I thought that was pretty neat because, um, you know, we're not, I don't know him. Um, and he's kind of a, it's kind of a big deal in the permaculture world. Um, <laughs> that's a tease, but, um, yeah, Sean, is for anyone who knows him or knows of him, if you followed his Edible Acres channel at all, um, I'll just share something about that. I just turned my dad on to your channel mm -hmm. and he had the reaction that I imagine most people have. He was like, oh man, I just went down the rabbit hole and I watched all these videos. And then he like literally like put his hand over his heart and he's like, and he's so kind. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really sweet. Boy. Yeah. And I think that people, I think people, part of why people respond to you is because you do bring a real, um, just a real like humbling kindness with you that I think can be sort of an antidote to a lot of the, like the big loud permaculture voices in the rooms. And so as someone who, um, I teach permaculture with the Shenandoah Permaculture Institute and I, you know, I'm in that world quite a bit. And I, it's one of the things that has really drawn me to your content, so. Um, I want to say thank you for that. And um, yeah, with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to you to share. So thanks, John. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. My gosh, my pleasure. And what a lovely introduction. And just watching 
Um, like I, I knew a little bit about what you all were up to, but just hearing now, like you've got this herb cooperative and all these different programs, like it's amazing what all you are trying to do to help support small regenerative farmers in your area. And that it's open to folks beyond, um, that's really sweet. So it, it reinforces why I said yes, which is like, there's good work being done to help people get empowered to grow more good things where they are. So thank you for that. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so I put together a 15 minute presentation here about propagating trees from seed. Um, I, I'm interested to see if I can pack in in 15 minutes what I'd like to say. And I will give some links and leads to deeper information that's available on our YouTube channel. But let me give myself a note so that I can keep track of things. And what I'd like to do here, I'm gonna start by, um, Please let me know if this doesn't show up the way it ought to. Is this showing up for folks? It's there. We've got it. Great. So this is a, a simple slideshow. And as far as I understand, there's going to be a link to this. So if anybody wants to revisit this and see photos uh, and the like, uh, please feel free to follow the link a little bit later on. And the arc of what I want to get into is basically showing this incredibly low tech low complexity approach that we use for growing trees from seed and as a nursery we grow or we help facilitate the growth of maybe uh, a few thousand many thousands of trees from seed a year i have no training in this and it's really scrappy diy and you'll see by the end that pretty much you can do this 100 percent with things you find around you so let's hop into that a little bit first things first is uh seed and so here we're looking at a picture of hazelnuts. And one of the things that draws me into growing trees from seed is the idea uh, that if a lot of the crops that we're harvesting are things we like to eat, like growing black walnut and Japanese walnut and cultivar heart nuts and chestnuts and hickory and hazelnuts. These are all foods for us. And so the process of harvesting those allows us to get food for ourselves that lasts through the winter. We can press oil, we can cook with them, but then we can also save uh, seed from that to grow out. So here we've got this beautiful, simple blue basket. Those are smaller hazels. We'll enjoy those for ourselves. And then we grade out the larger to grow on. So we're doing a little bit of selection and saving some for our own sustenance. And in my mind, that's a nice uh, sentiment to permacultures, integrate and stack functions, uh, these different activities. Part of why we like growing trees from seed is the whole process is fascinating and really beautiful. Here you see some chestnuts just beginning to sprout. Trees will often put their root down first and once they've committed to that, then they send up the, the actual shoot. And every year that's just a, a, a pretty exquisite process to watch happen. I was just planting a whole bunch of chestnuts and pecans and English walnuts today. And it's always amazing to see their roots trying. Um, what I want to show here is uh, some techniques that make it quite easy. We have uh, intense vole life where we are. We have chipmunks, we have squirrels, we have rabbits, we have deer. I'm suspecting a lot of folks watching this have similar pressures. And so rather than setting up traps or hunting or poisoning, we can set up systems that actually allow us to grow trees in any context without much stress. So uh, in 15 minutes, I can't explain in detail about air prune beds, but on our YouTube channel, which is linked in this uh, discussion, we have, if you search for air prune, a whole bunch of videos on how we build them, and we're just one of many folks that are making these. But in this uh, image, you see a one foot by two foot simple black locust box. It has a mesh on the bottom, and that sitting on some bricks on a driveway will let us grow 30 chestnuts. Um, and the boxes behind me are two feet by four feet with a nice cage on top to protect from rodents. And those will grow uh, 200 chestnuts, 300 hazelnuts. So in one parking space uh, on a driveway, literally on a driveway, that's where we have these set up sometimes, we can grow you know, two or 3,000 trees in one parking space in a year and then have it open for the, the winter to park in again. And another leverage with this is we we'll take a space. So here we're looking at our neighbor's lawn. This is what it looked like last spring. And he's given us permission to start farming ever increasingly into their landscape. It's a, a nice collaborative effort. And um, on that space, it was just basically a lawn with that 
prune boxes last spring. This was about April. You can see a bunch of air prune boxes where I dumped hay in between them. This is a nice monolithic raised bed that we grew some herbaceous perennials in. And then we are straight on the lawn. We just put as much hay as we could find, as much wood chips, et cetera. And wherever weeds popped up, we just added more mulch. And so then in the space last season with 10 fully populated air prune boxes, we were able to plant out uh, around uh, two to 300 trees per box and um, erase the lawn entirely in that space. And now it's a permanent raised bed system. So tree from seed growing with this particular technique is a way to also leverage weed eradication and permanent raised bed development while giving you a return for your efforts. So uh, not to be crude about it, but from a financial standpoint, we make our living entirely from the nursery work. This one little space, this leveraging of that space uh, uh, facilitated the growth of trees that'll fill 50 to 80 acres of land with food forest canopy crops like burr oaks and hickory and Japanese walnut and English walnut, a whole bunch of other beautiful plants and generated around $7,000 worth of income for us from a space that was roughly, uh, I would venture to guess it was 20 by 40 feet in that one space. And that's with no tillage, there's no irrigation, there's no machines. Uh, it's all just nutrient folding and moving. So it really works as far as a farming model uh, to incorporate tree growing as an income stream. And so then that's a basic flow for, for establishing uh, trees to grow them. And again, like I said, in 15 minutes, I really couldn't show you, this is exactly how we assemble them. All of that's documented on the YouTube channel if you want to explore that or look up other people's designs to get some ideas. But let's say you wanna get into growing trees. How do you store seed in order to grow them? So a lot of uh, hazelnuts will crop in August or September. The chestnuts will crop in late September, early October. How do we hold those seeds in a safe way to get them to the spring where they can then be planted? Because as you can imagine, especially nuts are incredibly desirable to all sorts of rodents during the winter, not only when they're growing. So here I'm taking a five gallon bucket. Uh, this is a great opportunity to look for buckets that are already leaky and drill a couple of holes in the bottom. I don't know that it has to be a particular size, but roughly a pencil to Sharpie size, it wouldn't go much larger. And a nice tight fitting lid that has some holes as well. And into that bucket, we can fill uh, layers or strata of, I just use woodland duff and soil, maybe old shredded leaves, old wood chips, aged wood chips, and layer upon layer of seed. So here, what we're looking at is the top of a bucket that has been filled with a few hundred, many, many hundreds of nice cultivar hazelnuts. And then just to give a little bit of additional insurance, I'll push some random leftover small cloves of garlic into that container. So if a vole does get in, they have to go through kind of an aromatic minefield before they can eat all the nuts. So in some years where they do get through, they chew through a hole, um, they, it preserves whatever nuts are right around that. And we snap the lid on tight and we put that outside buried a little bit in some well-draining soil. If you don't have well-drained soil, you can bank it in leaf bags or wood chips for the winter. You just want them to remain cool, moist, but not really solidly hard frozen. That is an incredibly accessible and low-tech way to do cold, moist stratification for tree seeds without much fuss. Um, here's a pretty old picture of me. You can see I got a lot more gray since then. Uh, but in this case, I'm holding a uh, nut wizard, which is a very simple tool. This would be a, a highly recommended tool to consider investing in that allows you to basically sweep up uh, nuts. In this case, this is a larger one, and we're using it in an arboretum. We're near uh, Cornell University, where they have a collection of amazing cultivar nut trees. And I think I'm pretty sure we have permission to collect. Uh, we talked to some folks that said, okay, and certainly the squirrels do it. So I think we can too. Um, but on a mode space, that's a, a way to harvest many nuts per second. And so that, that addresses both the harvest of some of these crops for our food security for the winter and for community food security. We processed around 2000 
pounds of black walnuts in community last fall. And a fair bit went towards seed for growing and a much larger amount went for eating. So investing in tools like a nut wizard or other things that facilitate collection of these seeds can be helpful in a lot of ways. So something to consider. Um, a side direction that I wanted to take here would be, uh, like I said, I was glancing the idea of growing trees from seed in the first slides. Some other pathways that might be compelling to folks. And again, I'll just plant, I'll plant the seed of the idea and you can either watch on our YouTube channel or other sources for more information. Um, Propagating trees by cuttings is another really viable and simple way to go. And what you're looking at in this photo is a, uh, a pail, a metal container that we got from a yard sale with some rainwater floating around the bottom, some old pots that we found. And what my right hand is holding onto is a container filled to the brim with various willows. So we're, we're uh, propagating the willows in water and then also sea berry, which is a pretty challenging uh, shrub to propagate, but the willow confers uh, sal salicin? Sal uh, anyway, it confers a, a rooting hormone that's helpful to other plants. I've tried making teas from it before, but that gets murky and pretty gooey and it tends to rot things, but willow when it's actively rooting seems to exude influence to other plants and other stems around them to help root as well. And in this case, we just have a simple bubbler. You can see some froth in there. And that's a $10 investment from a fish shop down the road of uh, an air bubbler that has a little stone that helps to turn the water and keep it oxygenated and fresh. And here you can see um, this is a sea berry stem that after about a week or two in the midsummer, so this would be considered soft wood or mid-season propagation, it is swelling at all of these nodes and these little points of whiteness that are just below the surface, that is where the roots will emerge. And so that's a pathway with very low investment or complexity to be able to propagate trees from cuttings. That's softwood mid-season propagation. Hardwood propagation is even easier, we simply take dormant cuttings of plants like elderberry, of willow, of currants, many other plants of that nature. We cut them to roughly six to eight inches and we push them in the soil in the fall with mulch or in the spring as they're just getting ready to wake up. And voila, you can get photocopies that way. So the process of growing trees uh, from seed or from cuttings is, I'll say it this way, as a person who has had no formal experience as a farmer, I have no training, I've gone through no, none of that sort of stuff. I didn't grow up in a farming family. And so I've been figuring it out as I go along in a, in a puttering way where a lot of things fail periodically, but some things work. Uh, with that sort of background and training, which is nil, and nearly no budget invested in this. We look for scrap lumber to build our air prune boxes. We take buckets that have a little bit of holes and use those to store seeds. We collect seeds from wild spaces around us or from orchards. Maybe where you live, there's some beautiful persimmons that crop in the fall. You can enjoy the fruit, process the fruit into leathers and store those seeds cool and moist in those sorts of containers and plant them out in the spring. You certainly don't need air prune boxes to grow trees from seed, but they are, they've been pretty helpful to us. Um, so basically no training, no background, no real budget, no complexity, no need to even buy in seed or really buy resources. You can certainly at least dip a toe by collecting seeds this fall, trying your hand at storing them. Maybe you try a few different methods and then growing them out in a few different ways next spring. Let's say you collect a thousand seeds, a hundred of them sprout and 10 of them turn into trees at maturity. You have hit extremely high levels of success based on what the woods is excited to see. A sugar maple, if they get one one hundredth of 1% success with their seed experiments are thrilled to bits. That's the next generation. So uh, if we work within the nature the natural picture that is presented to us, we can fail predominantly and still have some trees and be 
immersed in a positive direction uh, in nature there. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my little spiel on this. Here's some honey locusts that were grown from seed in a field. And in some ways, this is actually an example of what could have been considered a failure. We had planted, uh, we had taken the seeds that we collected from a tree that looked really nice uh, just along the street. It was next to a coffee shop. We just picked up the pods and stored them dry for the winter, poured hot water on the seeds in the spring and sowed them into a garden just like you would beans. They grew beautifully the first year. They were cut 100% flush to the ground by rabbits that first winter. And so we just left them. And here they've grown a second year and they put on a huge amount of growth with a really nice big root system. And we were able to offer up somewhere around a thousand honey locust trees to folks locally and afar with just hand tools and collecting seed from the, from the street basically. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward and it's really worth trying. If you have any proficiency with annual crop farming, you have all the skills and beyond that you need to grow trees from seed. We, as many trees as we grow, we still have a really hard time getting hot peppers and okra and eggplant and all sorts of what seem like straightforward annual crops to thrive for us. So if you're good at that, you can absolutely be a tree nursery. Um, and that's my little spiel about trying and exploring the concept of growing trees from seed. Uh, here you can see it is, um, our website is YouTube or our YouTube channel is uh, Edible Acres. And if you search for us, you can subscribe if you'd like or just look for different areas. We have some, uh, there's a playlist called Propagation. And if you pop into there, we've tried to stratify and organize different things that have worked for us in that area. So anything I've talked about this evening, you can find there if it's helpful. And thanks so much. I'm really excited to try to answer some questions and be helpful to folks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I love, um, I love tinkering around with this stuff on my own as well. And I think what attracts me to it is it's so, the barriers are so low. They really are so low. And I think you did a good job. Um, communicating that. So I hope that everybody, let me just second that in case you don't believe Sean, <laughs> he's, he's not lying. If you can, mm -hmm. if you can grow a tomato, you can definitely grow some trees. <laughs> yep. Um, and I just wanted to share that there was uh, a couple nice comments. One, just somebody saying they were really inspired. And then someone saying that uh, at their, at their house, they call you the, the Bob Ross of permaculture, I think is what it said. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet that's better than being called the jordan peterson of permaculture i get that one and i'm like oh i don't i don't care for that one but okay. <laughs> Bob Ross, i'll take any day of the week yeah no kidding <laughs> <laughs> all right so before we get into the q a we're gonna do just a quick fire round of just some like fun questions that you know are not necessarily related so we're looking for just short answers like 10 to 20 second answers here so what is your favorite thing about being a YouTube hero? Okay. Uh, and we're going to piggyback that with least favorite too. So favorite and least favorite. Well, I just don't see it as hero. I, you know, like for, for real, this is it. This, I have an old broken iPhone that I got used online that I record stuff we're doing in the garden. I upload it on a used computer using the free software on there. And I've made so many hundreds of them that at a certain point it's gained momentum that to me doesn't land in the solid realm of hero <laughs> but, so that's the part that i don't but other than that the the it, if i can reframe it the thing i like the most about being involved in youtube and having this channel grow is it feels incredibly sweet and reassuring to get the feedback from folks that something that we've put out resonated and helped them grow more food for their chickens or integrate a uh, composting system that might have improved the health of their hens or help them get out of the city and start growing food in a different context. So getting direct feedback from folks that there is actually a real world positive effect from it is probably definitely my favorite aspect to all this. Mm -hmm. Do you have a least favorite or a challenge? Do you feel beholden to posting or anything at this point? Um, I can, I feel a little gamed by the YouTube thing, like the you know, back end of it where you, uh, you know, tells you whether or not the video you just put out did better than another one you did. And it, it, it can like, it's 
it's up to me to act on it or not, but it can psychologically draw me into like, ooh, I, I should make another one and it needs to be about chickens because that's what does well. Um, uh, but if I zoom out, if I zoom out and, I'm, and I relax about it, it's like, okay, well, the I'm still trying to make videos that are helpful to people and not trying to do things just to like generate revenue or something. So then, okay, I'll, I'll try to make more videos. But I think sometimes I feel like, oh, I haven't made a video in three days. What's what's going on? I'm like, wait, 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 that <laughs> I don't need to think of it that way. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, have you been asked for an autograph yet? <laughs> nope, never. It's gonna it's gonna happen. <laughs> and you're gonna think of me now when it does. <laughs> I don't think I'm that big. I I really don't think it's that big a deal. It it's just numbers as far like. It really is the quantity of videos. If if anybody was making hundreds and hundreds of videos on a subject very consistently, it would start to gain traction if if there's some little kernel of quality in there. So mm -hmm. I, I just consider it that more than anything, but it's sweet, but I'll leave it there. Is there anything that you never leave home without? I don't know. Other than a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, I try to not have myself. I I I like to have a good pair of pruners and a hoary mm -hmm. with me. That's pretty helpful. Um, if I had to guess, I was gonna guess you would say pruners. <laughs> yeah, pruners and a mug of coffee, probably my water bottle, yeah. maybe those things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, is there a stubborn plant that you can just like can't quite crack the code on? <sighs> Buttercup is tough. I just I guess that comes to mind because like they that plant's been powerful very recently and exp and expanding. Um, there's a bunch. I mean, there's like Bishop's Weed, which I respect. I, and it's not like I have like, oh, they're so bad. Um, I, I respect all the plants for what they're up to, but um, I think it's like the really powerful creeping ground covers that also get like 10, 12 inches and are, they love fertile soil. They love openings because we keep we keep building our soil with compost, and we keep making openings by digging up trees. So those plants that enter in really quickly um, are pretty challenging. But I think I just need to learn that when that happens, we need to quit turning that into a nursery and just plant trees and let them be the ground cover. So then, in that case, I'm only I'm only battling because I haven't designed something better yet. <clears throat> And what was the last movie you watched? And was it any good? Boy, what did we watch last? I don't remember. <laughs> We've been watching like shows on Netflix and I can't yeah. even say what I, I don't even remember. <laughs> we we watch them and then like two days later, it's like, what was that even about? What was that? Yeah. It's yeah. like fall, fall asleep imagery is what we go yep. for. <laughs> the days yeah. are full enough. We're not trying to like <laughs> fill our life with the, the TV. Understandable. All right. So we're going to get into some of these uh, pre-submitted questions. So I get to the kind of fun job of uh, being sort of the voice of the people here. Um, so is there a species that you recommend everyone play around with? So I'm guessing that this is a question <clears throat> about like, you know, beginners. What's what's a good one to play around with? Um, you know, it's 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 hard to say something direct to that because I'm in zone 5B central New York. And so I don't know where people are. If you're in our general area and the question is around trees from seed in particular, mm -hmm. I think both hazelnut and chestnut are really rewarding. Um, they're very reliable. So long as you have really solid rodent protection, they can get to be a beautiful field ready size within one growing season. They're also very highly desirable. Like a lot of people know about those trees. So easy to collect seed, easy to store seed to grow, get a nice size and they're they're recognizable and they're really valuable. Um, so there'd be that would be that. I mean, that's probably general enough for most of the swatch of folks that are watching this. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, do you wanna talk briefly about your um, seed stock for those two? uh yeah sure so and sourcing i guess specifically yep it's all over the map there's there was a place where we had access there was an organic student farm where there was an experimental block of wild american hazelnuts that were planted and we used to collect from there but most of that was destroyed uh mm -hmm. we still collect with covid stuff we weren't allowed to be there and so then it was like that became a whole complex thing so i found i found a much older man in his 80s who had 
a planted block of Yamhill and Jefferson that was also associated with wild American. So huh. cultivated high quality European American hybrids in the context of what could be an unending wave of Eastern filbert blight pressure, not succumbing to that. And so that was my favorite source for a little while. And then that kind of dried up. So this last year we bought seed from Burnt Ridge Nursery yeah. And that's, that's TBD, whether or not I'm thrilled, they feel pretty dry. Most of the seed feels very dry <laughs> from them. Um, yeah. So far, I found almost to complete exclusion, seed that we collect ourselves from local sources, whether it's great or not, regardless, has been consistently very high viability and seed that we've paid good money to purchase from elsewhere has been very disappointing. Mm. And I'm not saying Burnt Ridge is bad. I'm just saying maybe I held their seed the wrong way. I don't know. But whatever I, we collect hazelnuts from folks, we get like 95% germination. So the, the good news there is wherever you live, exhaust all the possibilities. Talk to every person, follow every lead of like, do you know anyone with a chestnut? Do you know anyone with a hazelnut orchard that they don't collect from anymore? If you can get them local to you and you store them cool and moist consistently, right out of the gate with protection from bowls, you'd have extremely high success with very low cost as opposed to buying them in. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that's an area where like YouTube groups can, or not YouTube, uh, Facebook groups can really shine. Mm -hmm. um, just community groups, putting the word out there. Um, also NAFEX, if folks aren't familiar, the North American Fruit Explorers um, is a really great organization to check out. Um, and a really great community of folks. And there's a lot of uh, people there really interested in germplasm preservation and, um, you know, kind of spreading the word when, when they find a good source for stuff like that. So there's some good resources. Yeah. Okay, um, how do you decide what seedlings to grow in beds versus boxes? And are, and are you doing many bed grown seedlings? I know you had the video with the honey locust. Yeah. Right, I, and that's, I, my apologies would be that in fif the 15 minute context, I really didn't touch on the full spectrum of what we do. I would say the air prune box grow out, even though that was like the main thing I talked about because it's an interest to me, a really interesting technique that comprises maybe 30 to 50% of the total types of trees we grow. So to address the question of when air prune appropriate, when field grown, if, the tree is desirable to be consumed by any rodentia clan creature, if, if it's voles or whoever, uh, mice. So basically, if it is a nut, a, an edible nut, you almost certainly would want to think about growing them where there's uh, a container that has a mesh on the bottom so that creatures cannot climb in from the bottom and that there's a simple mesh over top. That um, and I talk about that in videos, and there's other designs out there. So, if edible as a seed, consider strongly committing them to air prune boxes. Secondarily, would be any plants that have an incredibly taproot oriented growth habit, which tends to be more nuts. But pawpaw is a good example of that. They like to put on a really long, scrawny root. If you have them in a good, healthy, rich, moist, well maintained, semi shaded air prune box, you can get very nice large seedlings that have great above ground uh, growth and a much more robust root system that lives in six to eight inches rather than a 18 inch long singular run with a couple lateral hairs on it. So the air pruning is about uh, protecting the seedlings from consumption by creatures without having to kill them or feel antagonism. It's just uh, excluding them from that one area. And also equally importantly, taking the tap root and cauterizing it by having it be exposed to air and then letting it reform more roots, those get trimmed and so on. So you get that fibrous root system. Field growing, I like to commit to most um, stone fruits. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. I think they just, they seem to make a bigger body. They have a lot more like good laterals and feathering that happens. Um, and then most Fabiaceae, most nitrogen fixers seem to be unbothered by rodents. Um, so all of uh, the river locusts that we do, honey locusts, black locusts, the, the like in that realm, they seem easier just to do in the field. But 
I think you can swap if you don't have really intense full pressure uh, or chipmunk. So we farm an acre in an open field where there's a hunter that lives there. We direct sow everything. There's English walnuts, there's chestnuts, everything goes right in the soil. And we lose some once in a while, but for the most part, it works. So if you don't want to build air prune boxes, plant out and see what happens. Got it. Nice. All right. Uh, what is your favorite tree to propagate? I don't, I definitely don't have one. I think they're all pretty compelling in different ways. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not good at like, that's fair. What, what's the best, <laughs> what's the worst? Like they, I, yeah. I work with, we work with like at least 30 different types of trees. They're all, it's amazing. Pawpaws, the roots smell like black peppercorn and patchouli and yeah. persimmons <laughs> have jet black root systems and chestnuts are always so like powerful and ready to expand and every tree is just like an absolute joy to, to hang out with so mm. they're all good you're a little bit of an ent i think that's what it sounds like to me um this is a nerdy moment i'm having by myself uh favorite functional willow variety oh interesting that's another one that's hard to say i um yeah we've got so many mia bina comes to mind incredibly fast really huge leaves amazing mulch plant massive catkins so it's incredible biomass and nectar flow and and uh pretend probably really high quality fodder plant packing twine purpurea salix purpurea var packing twine the first year shoots you can straight up snip them with pruners and tie knots like just use them as rope oh, cool. Like no cordage or twit, like they are just that you pull as hard as you want and you got like cordage all over the place. Um, Vigorella is ridiculous in how beautiful the flowers are. Melanostachys has incredible winter color. Aquatica gigantia is just crazy thick. I, they're all cool. I don't know. Um, I think the basket willows are pretty compelling because you can maintain, you can keep them low and there's just a lot of utility there. Um, mm -hmm. But we work with around 20 or 30 varieties and I, I enjoy most of them. Some of them feel a little redundant. There's like 10 different basket types, but um, yeah. Someone said, what was the first? Was that the, uh, did you say Miabiana? Or, I don't oh, know. Uh, Mia Bina, M-I-Y-A-B-E-A-N-A. Yeah. -A -A. Mm -hmm. uh, SX61 is another name if you want in the American version. <laughs> that was like the breeding project name but it's a it's yeah. just a really great utility if you want like the one of the faster willows uh that there is that's i mean they'll get like that big around and like 30 feet tall in, in like four or five years yeah they're pretty incredible um okay is there a shortcut to get honey locust seeds out of the pods uh well so you can you can collect pods in the fall and lay them out on racks so that they dry really thoroughly, that the seeds in the pods and um, two paths that you can take there. You can either do, you can store them like that and then in the spring do um, a good hot water bath. So a fair number of seeds need scarification which can mean that you abrade the seed coat until there, there's a wound or it's a break and then moisture can enter and they, they'll germinate. But you can also get there with hot water, not boiling, you're not bringing them up to boil like a soup stock, but imagine you're making a huge pot of tea out of the seeds. And in the past, I've done a few things. We pour extremely hot water over them like a big thing of tea with the pods and everything. And then the pods are softer. You can either rip them up and lay them out or just lay them with the pods in a garden bed and put soil on top. Um, but you definitely have an easier time if you actually crack them up apart. You could probably do some sort of whisk or agitation. The seeds are rock hard, so abrading and that would, would break the pods a bit and allow the seed to fall out. You can winnow if you want. Um, we've done it a couple different ways, but um, one year I soaked them really thoroughly and then I think my wife Sasha went through and like picked out the swollen seeds and we thumbed them in. But I've also laid in the pods after a hot soak and you know some get stuck in there, but for the most part they grow. Hmm. Nice. Um are there any are there any species that you feel like you've really has been like a really difficult stratification or scarification that you've been able to like crack the code on that you have like some really valuable intel you want to share? I'm sure it's all on your YouTube, but 
Anything you care to share here? Um, well, okay, so Gumi, um, Eliagnus mm -hmm. multiflora, which is incredibly high demand. There's honeyberry, there's Gumi, and seaberry are like ridiculously high demand crops that I, I we propagate them actively, but we're still interested in ramping them up for our own purposes mm -hmm. first. Gumi, uh, as a cousin to autumn olive, uh, but not technically illegal and whatever that whole thing is, but um, the the Eliagnus plan, both autumn olive and gumi, seem to they seem to be really hard to grow from seed until you recognize that it feels like they're obligate to not letting the seed dry out. And so this last few seasons, when we harvest gumi and we're enjoying the fruit, we have folding crates that are rodent protected that can be closed up and buried under leaves, and we'll we'll have them with like an informal mix of aged compost at the bottom, some wood chips, and then a nice strata of something like a McEnroe light or like a, a really simple seed starting mix that's on the top. And as we're eating the fruit, we thumb in the seeds and each row as they get filled out, we put a little bit of sawdust on there and just kind of fill it down the whole line and then close it up at the end of the cropping season, bury it under some leaves and let it cold stratify and then open it in the spring and they, they have really good germination when we do that. It's like 80, 90%. Um, mm -hmm. I think seaberry seems to be a similar, they're not technically Eliagnus, but they seem mm -hmm. very much, they have to have some common lineage. So that particular weird clan of nitrogen fixing shrub tree fruits seem to really need their seeds to not dry out. And that's, that's absolutely true of pawpaw. Anyone that's tried to grow yeah. pawpaw, you let the seed sit out for a day, it's done, 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just knowing those little nuances, and once you get a feel for it and you realize a way to act uh, act within that, it's not this like co cold or warm, moist stratification for 120 days, cool, <laughs> moist stratification for 90. And more. When, you, when you see that, it's like, there's no way I can ever do it. But when you just relax your eyes and you kind of think, well, what does that mean? It's like, Oh yeah, the summer, the fall, the winter, the spring, right? <laughs> so yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have to like put calendar <laughs> stuff. I just have to do a thing for a season and then they'll wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna pr pretend to be this specific season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've talked uh, a couple times about moisture. Could you just talk a little uh, specifically about how you, like you talked about it for Gumi just now, you talked about a little bit about your hazelnut seed being dry. Do you want to just mm -hmm. talk a bit, little bit about stratification process and moisture content and just, you know, uh, strategies for success there? Sure. Yeah. Um, oh, it's pretty informal. The way we have a root cellar that I built, uh, that's we made some videos about that. It's incredibly janky, but it works fine enough. It's simple. Mm -hmm. And that's down in our basement. And that's where we store our potatoes and onions and things. We also st store crates of seed down there. Uh, and I've made some videos of going through those and showing what we do. But basically, uh, cold, moist stratification, what you don't want to do is just have a bulk of seed raw in a container buried down in the earth. You want some sort of media around them to hold them. And that can be so many different things. Some folks like sand because it, it's like relatively low fungal, it freely drains, but it still retains humidity and all that that's fine but then i find it's so freaking heavy and if i'm carrying stuff up and down the stairs uh -huh. straight play sand is, is a misery it's like 80 pounds of thing yeah um, so what we've landed on is a little bit of a mix of healthy alive garden soil mm -hmm. with a lot of sawdust from like a you know decent hardwood mills and something without pressure treated and or there's an aged pile of shredded leaves somewhere Basically, to simplify it is like, imagine if if you were a hazelnut and a squirrel found you, what would they do in order for you to grow? They would dig a hole and put you down in the earth and then leaves would fall on top. And ideally there'd be lots of leaves around because you'd be in the woodland's edge and that seed will generally germinate. So how do we mimic that without a lot of fuss? And it's like, you know, aged wood chips, shredded leaves, garden soil, if you're growing something like a wine cap mushroom, like a nice cleanup mushroom that does good digestion, 
folding that is great because the wine cap likes to have a mild winter. And so in our cold, you know, negative 18 and two feet of snow, you can lose some wine cap patches, but they can overwinter next to the seeds. And we found when you include, for example, pawpaw persimmon, where there's lots of pulp and there's stuff there, mm -hmm. we just put in red wiggler worms from a compost stream oh. and the wine cap and the two of those together, the worms eat every last, they clean up the pawpaw seeds, they're immaculate mm -hmm. by the end of the season. And then the wine cap cleans up the rest and you're left with worm castings, uh, edible fungal spawn and perfectly clean, moist, happy seeds. And there's like a little ecosystem that got to happen the whole winter. So it's the exact opposite of you must wash them and bleach them and put them in a plastic bag with a moist <laughs> paper towel in your refrigerator. If you want to do that, go ahead. I'm not going to say don't do it, but I can tell you dirt with worms and mushrooms and stuff you found with the fruit still on it is like the happiest, healthiest plump seeds by the spring. And it feels mm. a lot nicer. It smells good. And it's cool to see worms like wrapped around persimmons, eating them up. Yeah, that's, it does sound really nice. <laughs> I like it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, are those going straight into the cold? Like as soon as they're in the buckets, they're going into the cellar? Yeah, it's. I think it, the respectful thing to the tree seed if it's if it's a if it's a rock hard seed that drops dry, so your all your nitrogen fixers and diff, like um, different fruits like that, you can just store the seed dry like it's an like a brassica or dried beans. If it's a seed that falls as a nut, or if it's seed that falls ensconced in fruit, yeah. the feel is how do we maintain like it's cool in the fall and how does it just keep getting gently cooler to right around freezing but not much below and nice and evenly moist we're not washing them and drying them we're just getting some of the pulp off sending it to the chickens and then the rest is getting mixed with that woodland soil uh, and either into a root cellar if that's what you have or wherever you live if it's a mild winter you can leave put things outside with some leaves on top if you're zone five or colder you find a well-drained spot, dig in a little, settle the containers, and then put the soil with leaves back on top. Imagine that you're pretending you're a squirrel putting the seeds, you know, six to eight inches down in the earth. Do you stratify anything in refrigeration at all, like, you know, commercial refrigeration, or is it all got it? Yeah, because the refrigerator, it's always filled with, like, food for our animals and our own stuff, and to buy, you know, a separate refrigerator for the nursery or like make a room with a cool bot and all that kind of stuff. I'm just not interested in it. It's like we have a room in the basement that gets cold from the winter. If it gets real cold, we jam a sock in the tube. And, <laughs> you know, then there's outside, which is really cold. And if you're down in the ground a little, it's 55 degrees. So it's like, okay, <laughs> we got yeah. all the refrigeration we need uh, just out in the world, you know? Yeah, that's great. Do you have any rat problems? Have you ever had that be an issue with your in-ground bucket stratification system? Um, so rats come around sometimes. We have a chicken composting system and that that's a pretty powerful attractant for rats. Um, and it's funny because it's a really common question on the YouTube channel. I've never had rats burrow through I think a five gallon bucket is a pretty thick plastic. And if the if you have concerns of creatures digging through them, make the holes more numerous and smaller mm -hmm. so that you get the same amount of drainage, but with less purchase. I've had holes opened up by voles before here or there, if they were really big holes, if they're already like, you know, half inch or bigger. Um, but if you have real concerns of rodents like rats or voles, consider quarter inch or hardware or half inch hard metal hardware cloth baskets so that it's fully metal that you can bury. Mm -hmm. um, or, and consider planting your seeds directly. If you do any garlic production or any home garlic or commercial garlic, consider a row of garlic. We've talked about this in videos where it's like, let's say a 30 inch bed. Your first two rows are garlic. And then it's a row of tree seed, 
then garlic, then tree seed, and then two rows of garlic or one row of garlic. And so then they're already planted out in the fall. They can grow when they're ready. Um, and rodents tend to not go in there. That all being said, rats have shown up in our chicken yard. They've been only amazing. They burrow <laughs> down underneath the compost and they make these like two inch diameter holes that go to the outside and allows cool oxygen under the compost to aerate it. And they make mm -hmm. the compost healthier and they're awesome. And they're really beautiful with their kids. They like teach their kids what to eat and what not to eat. And they've never heard our chickens. So rats are rad. We have no problems with rats. Nice. Um, rooting hormone. Someone says, I read Trees of Power. I know Akiva doesn't recommend using rooting hormone. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I don't. Uh, that's so gnarly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the full details on it. Akiva shared with me. He did some research on the IBA stuff and pretty uh, as far I could be wrong on this I'm sure there's variations on it but there's a fair bit of them like the rutone stuff it's a known carcinogen to humans um comes in a plastic jar it's not cheap and if uh if you want to help plants root if you root them in association with willow the the active growth of willow seems to just like it's overly generous it's like okay Nitrogen fixers let nitrogen into the soil. Willow puts rooting into the soil or puts rooting into the yeah. water. So if they're around, they help. Um, and to my mind, if a plant is that hard to propagate that it requires that level of intervention to do it, it's not the right fit for me. And so I'm just going to pass over it. There's other plants to work with. Um, so I'm, I'm like, you know, maybe I'm like keeping myself beginner, intermediate propagator and that that's fine. I just don't want to do like tissue culture and spraying alcohol on the cutters. Like if I have to do that, it's the plant's amazing. I'm just not going to technically go there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. but I, would skip, I would explore other things before rooting hormone. Can you dip them in raw honey or make a, a warm honey water? We've soaked cuttings in raw honey in warm tea water before and let hmm. them sit for a few minutes to draw in antifungal and amino acids and carbohydrates to like help with rooting. Yeah. That's something to explore. Interesting. Um, and if folks aren't familiar with Akiva Silver and the book Trees of Power, um, I think on your website, it, you refer to the, your two operations as brother nurseries, mm -hmm. which is sweet. Um, but uh, Akiva's up in Sean's area and has a wonderful book called Trees of Power. He's got multiple books, but um, in terms of specific to the information in this webinar, you can't go wrong with that book. Absolutely. Highly recommend. I got to um, hang out with Akiva today. We haven't seen him in a while. A that's real so student. nice. Yeah. Um, all right. Someone says, I can't find black locusts in my area. What other wood would you recommend or not recommend for uh, air prune boxes? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say whatever wood you can find in the waste stream where you are. Maybe it's that you're, uh, there's a wealth of heat treated pallets where you are. Can you build air prune boxes based on pallets? You can cut them and maybe put half inch hardware cloth on the inside as your rodent protection and your um, the, the holding for the soil and the roots. That's a possibility. Um, it, it's not like they, I, I would strongly avoid brand new milled lumber from a box store that's prohibitively expensive and definitely skip the pressure treated. Uh, if you build an air prune box out of some scrap wood where you are and it lasts four or five years, you might have grown, you know, 600 trees in there. It's paid for itself. The, or the wood can return to the earth. Um, if you find larch where you are, that's a lighter rot resistant wood. Hemlock is decent and pretty ubiquitous. Um, white oak is amazing if you if that's what's around. But I would say just whatever whatever you can find where you are, um, you can always extend the life of the wood if it's really not rot resistant. Consider dumpstering some cardboard and use a box cutter and make a little slice so that the cardboard is right in between the wood and the soil. And then in the fall, empty it all out let your air prune boxes be dry. And I would suspect sugar maple in that scenario would be good for 10 years. Wow, very cool. Um, can you talk about 
your closed loop system and why that's so important for you. How could I start closing loops on my own site? Which obviously you don't have a ton of information to answer that, but maybe some low hanging fruit. Uh, I think with it's, you know, we call ourselves a permaculture nursery. And part of the reason why I stick with that, because I think there are issues that I find in the permaculture community. And like you alluded to, sometimes it's like really, you know, you got to go big and here's this thing. And it's, it's a little mm -hmm. performative. That is whatever it is, but it's the principles of permaculture as a concept that are really uh, magnetic to me. And yeah. I think whenever you, whenever you look at things through the idea of like, how do I value the marginal? How do I start small? What the slow and small solutions integrate rather than segregate. If you look, if you give yourself the time to read through the there, it's all just common sense stuff. But what does it look like to, you know, ask yourself, do you need to buy that tool? Do you need to bring this other material in? Can we just repurpose this other thing that's happening? Can we find this in the local waste stream? Can there be nutrient parts of your system? Is there, uh, are clearly most folks are probably interested in their food scraps being composted, but if you have animals, can that be integrated with that? Can there be wood chips and other waste streams that you're bringing in to build soil. So at this point, we don't really need to buy in much at all of potting mix. We get some perlite, we get some macanro stuff for seed starting where it's like really tiny cells, but there's so much waste uh, still somehow, even with how expensive things are, you can yeah. find that uh, very easily. And then I think part of the loop is not saying it all has to happen right within my own land, but like, what's the loop of your community? And when you're going to, you're hoping to have something come to fruition, can you share that hope with a lot of folks and say what you're hoping for and see, oh, well, you know, I know this guy or my uncle has this thing. And you might want to talk to that person who would be thrilled to get some chestnut seeds and they've got this material laying around that they're looking for a home for. And to my mind, that is just, if not more so valid in closing the loop is like our communities mutual, mutually supporting each other and needing less and less of like constant inflow from a, a pretty gnarly and, and busted system that's around us. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like when we close the loop, we, we grow the community. It's that mm -hmm. stacking of functions. Yeah. Um, Lovely, lovely. All right, so we're gonna do a little segue into our live questions. So take a moment, folks, if you haven't um, added your questions to the Q&A, you can do it now while we have another quick fire round of un unrelated questions. <laughs> um, first, what was the last song that was stuck in your head? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I make up weird songs all the time. It was some, <laughs> It was some weird inane doofball song that I was making up about something probably, <laughs> but I couldn't tell you, I'm not sure. At least it was catchy enough to like loop in your head. I mean, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any secret talents? <laughs> um, I don't know why I just came to mind. Tuvan throat singing, like doing throat singing. That's kind of fun. But I'm not going to do it. That is a now. secret talent. That'll be that'll oh. be a different thing some other time. <laughs> That's on you know part five. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday that'll be like a background song to a video if I want to be weird. About it. Um, if you were going to be reincarnated as an animal, which one? <laughs> These are some random questions. Wow. <laughs> um, Keeping you on your toes, you know. What would it be? I really don't know. How about maybe as a tree? Is that easier? <laughs> I feel like a, I somehow a squirrel came to mind. Ooh. Just I feel like I, I a lot of times I'm out doing stuff and I'm looking at squirrels and I'm like, oh yeah, you're doing that too. And they're like, I've watched <laughs> them. I feel like I could learn a lot um, by what, like if I got to be a squirrel, like how to plant seeds better. Cause I watch them like take them out and try them again. And there's a communication that they have with, with trees that is pretty, mm much deeper and more compelling than I than I understand. Nice. It's a very elegant answer. Good work. Um, let's see. So you're now, you're currently, you're an educator and a content creator and a nursery person. What did you want to be as a kid? Um, I mean, I really enjoyed gardening 
with my mom in a really in, like wacky and formal way. I grew up in suburban New Jersey and that's that's a lot of what was going on there. I thought I wanted to be a 3D graphics animator when I was in middle school and high school and I studied fine art and like experimental computer graphics stuff in college. Um, yeah, it was like computer art was what I thought I was gonna do at first. I, I still enjoy looking at what people are doing with that sometimes, but it, there's so little delicious food in that. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of started to stray away from it. And then the, re the rest was history because it all, every step of the process of growing more and more food and having relationships with plants just kind of like secured that path as being the one that felt the most important for me. Nice. All right. All right. I'll give you a break and we'll ask straightforward questions. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, Nicole asks, what are your top plants for the chicken run? I live in Colorado, so it's just dry and zone four to five-ish, massive swings in temperatures uh, from day to night. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't speak to what would thrive exactly in your scenario. I can say pretty straightforwardly, like the, by a long shot, the one that seems to be the most hardy, really nice in a lot of ways is elderberry in there. Mm -hmm. the, the chickens really appreciate the fruit. The elderberry loves the excess fertility that's offered by them, but it also is a deep source of shade in midsummer and like a little bit of a sense of security for them. So that would be one I would really, really strongly encourage is elder. Um, we have thornless blackberries that are woven through the fence line. And that's probably the hens when they're a little overripe, they just flip for them. Um, so that's been really fun. I think currants are a nice fit. They don't really like red currants or black currants right away, but when you shake the bush and then they're on the ground, they graze them later. Um, I think willow has been nice because it grows really fast. We can cut it and they're like, are kind of interested in the leaves, but it just casts so much shade and they're so malleable. So throughout the season, we can be harvesting and like laying it down uh, and covering. Um, goji berry has been growing really nice. It really loves the chicken yard context. And I think we, this year we'll get to see how much they like the fruit. I suspect they will. Um, but it certainly thrives in, it, that would be a very good one for very wide temperature swings, cold winters, hot summers. Goji seems like a great candidate. And seaberry thrives in there. And we, we've we been bringing some fruit and pulp and the, the hens seem to really enjoy that as well. Um, I think whatever you have excess of that's easy to propagate, whatever you plant in the chicken run, it seems uh, wise to put a pile of rocks and debris around them so they don't scratch them out and maybe a fence if they're really going hard at it. But those are some that come to mind early on is like fast growing, nutrient loving, adaptable fruits that ideally also cast shade and make complexity that's well above the hen height. Yeah, and it also sounds kind of like uh, everything you mentioned is kind of thicketing, like that, mm -hmm. that thicketing habit. Yep. And chart, um, like chard and kale, like that that stuff too. I you know, annuals for sure, but chard is their like absolute number one green. If you can establish that somehow in the chicken yard, they just flip for that. Interesting. All right. Julia says, when you collect seed, do you evaluate the health or production of the adult plant from which you get the seed? In what ways do you evaluate the genetics of your seed before you choose to use them? And before you answer that, you should tune back in. <laughs> to Jonathan McRae's session because he's going to talk a lot about this stuff. Oh, good. But um, you should answer too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say, you know, it's like this really aggressive, you know, oh, unless it's ex this exact form, we don't take it the seed at all. I like to give a lot of seed a chance. Um, that being said, okay, let's say we're in a, a block of hazelnuts, of seedling hazelnuts that are planted out. We have access to harvest. Uh, if there's trees or shrubs that have really, really tiny nuts, a lot of times we'll skip over them or we'll collect them to give them to the chickens, crush them up. Um, I like to select, you know, larger seed when it seems appropriate. If I see any disease pressure on the plants, I try to skip that. So that knowing what Eastern filbert blight looks like and trying to avoid saving seed from hazelnuts that express that or knowing what cankers look like on chestnut trees, if they're like American dominant genetics, 
and there's whole scaffolds and branch sets that are really senescing early or looking anemic or, or dead, maybe that's not a tree to collect seed from. But in general, aside from like very glaring issues of, of you're like, whoa, you're really in disrepair. Um, one, I, I like to just collect seed. One thing I really go for in downtown Ithaca near us, there's a policy where they, they nail these metal plates onto street trees that say, this tree scheduled to be removed. And they leave it for years. They just hammer them into the trees. Like there'll be a red bud or a honey locust where they just put this thing like you're gonna die. And they they just leave it there and the tree starts to grow over the plate and eventually they kill the tree. Whenever I can collect seed from those trees, I definitely do. If a tree's going to be killed, I wanna get seed so they have, at least have a chance to like have their kids go somewhere. Um, all of our tulip poplar seedlings are grown out from a great, great, great grandma tulip poplar that's in decline. Maybe it's disease. It's more likely than anything. It's the road is toxic and she's just like having issues with that. And it's like a hundred year old tree. So like all of those kids are how we grow out our tulip poplar. So some of it is kind of like ascribing personality and destiny and value to the beings of them and thinking like this grandpa deserves to have their kids leave the woods or whatever and if I can think of it through that lens then I just feel a sweetness and I want to collect seed from a wider range rather than like well this nuts you know 13 percent lower density than this other one the shell's a tiny bit thicker than I'd like I'm like well they they feel sweet let's <laughs> let's give them a home yeah yeah, you are a squirrel you, and you are Bob Ross. You're like ferreting these happy little trees away. <laughs> right, well, didn't Bob Ross do a thing? He was like using a little pipette of milk with a squirrel in one of the videos. There's like a weird video yeah. with his long fingered nails. Like a little bit sketchy, but but sweet, I think, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Look it up at Bob Ross with squirrel if you want to see weird combo there. <laughs> um. Joe says, I have native Coralis Americana. Do you recommend getting named varieties or hybrids for propagating? Um, I, hybrids. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's, I'm not gonna strongly recommend it. I think there's value, um, all of the trees, but hazel, the smaller, the smaller, more wild trees are generally extremely blight resistant. They're extremely cold tolerant and wind resistant. They're extremely tolerant to hard browse and regrowth. And they provide ex a very high value food for turkeys, for squirrels, for deer. And so if you're not looking explicitly for a marketable crop for you for sale, for ecosystem service, for soil conservation, erosion control, windbreak, go for whatever seed you can get. If you're thinking about like, I have a quarter acre that I wanna maximize the most food production I can. I have room for three hazelnuts on four foot centers over here. Look for cultivars and um, ideally, you know, open seed groups. I wouldn't get cloned or um, grafted chestnut or hazelnut. I would just look for good parentage of, of those varietals. And, and so far for us, Jefferson and Yamhill they're really stellar. They've got they've got a lot of like Avalana, the the European morphology. They're like they're actually I think going to be really nice for making um, fencing and for building and for handles and tools. Like they get some beefy beefy stalks, but they have enough American genetics to be cold hardy to our region. So yeah, I think both both have extreme value. It just depends on what what are your goals for what those plants are going to offer. Nice. Um, Amy asks, do you truly never weed? I'm, I'm, I'm adding the head bob with that. <laughs> and when you need to move on from one area, which weed is the main issue motivating you? I, I weed all the darn time. I'm, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure I would, I, maybe I off, maybe I just give that sense, but, um, <laughs> I beds that are in production that we're trying to do like complex. We, we have a lot of beds. I, I should have taken some photos of this, but whatever, but like we'll have four foot beds where the middle third is committed to nursery crops. So it's like propagating from cuttings or seedling cherries or whatever it is. And then the two external thirds that face us are for annual crop production. And those beds, I, I'll go through with a hoary like every week and just pop out dandelions and little things. Cause all that is food for our chickens. 
Um, I think when a place gets weedy enough, like I just haven't kept up with it in a while or something like, you know, a bishop's weed or a, whoever comes in, then I, I assess whether or not it's worth just scrapping that for being like high value, intimate annual rotation work. And let's just get it to shrubs and trees and let it, let it move up into succession. Cause I'm not trying to fight that being in that context. Um, so if I was unclear there, sorry about that, but yeah, I, I'm out there like doing all, you know, pick, cause I, <laughs> our chickens eat the weeds. That's the main reason why it feels worth weeding. Cause I could fill a crate and send it to them and they turn it into eggs. So <laughs> it's all yeah. food. And I would argue that if anyone tells you that they don't ever weed, they're, they're probably full of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's parts of our system that I don't weed anymore, but they are, sure. 10 year old complex high density food mm -hmm. farm systems. So those, those do start to like get into autopilot where it's like once a year, I might spend 20 minutes pruning some branches so I can get through and that's mm -hmm. kind of it. But yep. nursery yep. stuff is like, you know, pretty intimate, high intensity agriculture for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, Brian says, do air prune beds affect resource inputs, e.g. irrigation compared to sowing in the ground? Sure. Yeah, I think um, so. We talk about this in the videos, but I, I try to make a pseudo hugel culture in our air prune boxes, which means at the very bottom, the, the lowest strata, first couple inches, is chunky woody debris. There's charcoal pieces. Sometimes we put bones in there. So it's like a very coarse material, but also pretty spongy. And that creates aeration and allows drainage pretty freely. And then we use uh, aged chicken compost that has lots and lots of shredded leaves and old wood chips, which all have really good moisture retention. Um, and then we mulch the beds very deeply with wood chips, especially things like chestnut and walnut that can emerge through a lot of deep deposition. We, we mulch thoroughly. If all those things are done, they need watering, but it's not too immense. Um, our entire system runs without a well. We, we do all of our farming with collected rainwater and like hand dug ponds and stuff. So irrigation is an absolute limiting factor. There's no like ch 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 systems here. It's like we're walking with watering cans. So um, yeah, the air prune boxes require more. In ground requires a lot less. And if you have an average good rainfall, 30, 40 inches of rain a year kind of thing and you're mulching and you're building organic matter, you'll find that your tree cropping systems uh, in, in nursery uh, context require a quarter as much of your time and input and watering as uh, a, a standard like CSA market garden sort of context. You can mulch them much deeper than you can like a carrot row. You've got to go in there all the time. Hazelnuts, you can put on like four inches of, of shredded wood chips and they just pop through and they grow and they hold all the water and they make fungal networks in there as well. And that all conspires to hold more water too. Nice. Um, okay, anonymous question. Will a hazelnut sprout if it doesn't have a shell or if it's blanched? Uh, I, without a shell, yeah, it seems possible. Um, yes, I think so. Blanched, I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, I've seen seeds go through extreme duress and still be viable. So, you know, boiling for a second or two or simmering for a little bit, if that's what they're asking, seems like it would still potentially sprout. You could always try. But one thing I should say on that, because people do, they'll say stuff like, oh, with peach seeds, you got to crack every seed and get the nut, the, the kernel out and plant it in a bed. And you've got to crack the English walnut, or you got to take the shell off in order for it to, you don't have to do that kind of stuff. Like the, the, <laughs> the seed <laughs> will emerge when they're ready. Push the apricot right in, push the peach right in. You know, you don't have to clean every last fleck of it. The persimmon is not going to rot in the ground if there's still a little bit of pulp from the fruit around them. This isn't a realm that that requires sanitary conditions or like a physical interaction with every seed. Nature grows things with that. We are, we are not a necessary cog in nature for plant propagation. We just can facilitate it. So don't overthink it. You don't need to crack the things. All right. So just for time check, it's 824. We've got, I think like six or seven more questions. So we'll just hit as many as we can. Um, 
Can you describe your workflow and schedule for production and sales in a bare root system? Are you only selling fall through spring? And do you pot up anything in spring for sales throughout the season? Uh, so to the last part, we do pot up plants. It's not like that used to be how we did the nursery early on when it was small and growing. We've been doing this for about 10 years now. And that was fine. Uh, we still have a pile of pots that we dumpstered from other nurseries that we're slowly burning through, not burning, but like using up to put plants in and sell to people. So we, you know, we potted up a bunch this year, but that's not our main focus. We do a big push of bare root <clears throat> shipping and local sales in spring. We take orders at the beginning of March and try to satisfy them through March, early April as fast as we can. And then we take orders September, uh, beginning of September, and then try to satisfy them October, November, as fast as we can. Climate change makes it remarkably exciting to try to figure out what the heck to do. You get like, you know, 32 degrees and then it's 86 and you figure it out. But um, that is the, like 90% of our exchange of plant material for money or trade is bare root plants, both spring and fall. And we've learned over time to wait, uh, W-E-I-G-H-T, the sale and the movement of grasses in the spring. They are happier. There's some herbaceous plants that do better to be moved in the spring. We try to do the bulk of our tree transactions in the fall because they tend to do much better to be established in the fall where they are going to live. So over time, it's like we're stratifying and, and shifting the proportions of who's offered when um, and based on what we have in, in abundance. I, I don't know if that it answers the time part, the, the workflow, that's a whole, that's a whole conversation sometime. And we're still just floundering around figuring it out, but it's, it's coming together over the years. Any success with rooting hazels or any other nuts? Uh, from cuttings, absolutely not. I, I have not had any success, solidly 0%. Stool layering is a valid pathway to clone hazelnuts. And you can find videos on that subject, but it's, it's slow. So if you're in it for the long haul, you can take a young hazel that's extremely promising and you can bank uh, aged debris, woody material around the stem, keep banking it for a season or two. And after two years, pull it away. And a lot of the younger shoots will have decent root, uh, ropey rooted shoots that can be trimmed off and transplanted. Uh, promising plants can be coppiced where they're cut low and the new growth is banked in sawdust and that will facilitate stooling at a slightly faster rate within a year or two. Um, they don't love, they're not super amenable to that. People do tip layering and the way you have to wound it and you have to pin it and put rocks and blah, blah. Um, Hazel so immensely easy from seed. They don't drift massively from their parent. That is far and away my preferred method for propagation. But yes, you can clone them through stool layering and to some extent tip layering, although I have no direct experience with the latter, but stool layering I have. Um, oof, we probably don't have time for much on this. I'd be interested to hear your short version though. How do you approach building local community? Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> Good question. Yeah, thank you. All these questions are awesome, by the way. Thank yeah, you. they really are. Compelling and challenging and, and appreciated. Um, building community, boy, I, I think um, being in it for the long haul, like um, mm. having conversations with people and following leads and, and like I alluded to before, I, I have what some people would probably consider a weird way of doing things, but I, it works for me and it feels, it feels good where I, I feel comfortable at cold calling people. Like somebody has, you know, they raise animals and I just call them up and like, do you ever have freezer burn meat? Are you interested in trading that for some, some leftover chestnut trees? Or like, you know, I, I, I know you had a flood over there and the, the stream blew out. We've got tons of willow cuttings. Are you interested in trading that for cheese that you have? Or like, you know, talking to, like we talked to a person who run who ran a roof metal manufacturing company and worked out this long-term trade of getting uh, excess roof metal in exchange for planting trees with them. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's constantly sharing what your hopes are, what you're looking for, and what it is that you're excited about that you have to offer 
feels like a way to build up this like a really robust exchange flow where we can start to take steps pretty rapidly away from needing uh, an external digital economy or even like normal currency economy and start doing mutual aid and support um I think doing presentations locally and going out to plant sales and like being in the community physically like on these different days where there's this Earth Day thing or there's an event where you can go and share what you're up to, um, all that helps quite a bit too. Okay, Joe says, I have a lot of free pine mulch available and keep hearing I need to keep it away from fruit trees. How crucial is this in your opinion? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have uh, just straight pine as a thing to work with. To my mind, when in doubt, anytime there's a mulch or <clears throat> a bulk organic material, a bulk carbon that's coming in that I have question marks around, I commit it intensely to uh, deep deposition in walkways because I can always use more mulch in the walkways to yeah. do heat suppression, water retention, and then it's not putting that exact leachate right next to the root zone of the tree. Anything that is off pH, nutrient, whatever wise, seems to rectify given enough time and with deposition it can just the worms can come up and incorporate them stuff can leach and relax and then slowly move in so i wouldn't put it six inches deep you know brand new pine around apple trees i don't know but i would feel very comfortable with black walnut or pine or sawdust eight or 12 inches deep in walkways or in swales or that kind of down slope of a composting system to catch excess nutrient um, so that'd be my answer there without too much direct experience on that. Nice. Um, Farmer Try says, how do you manage work, life, social media, et cetera? Do you have help? Um, yeah, it's, it, we're, uh, feeling the edge of what is manageable and what feels good. Um, it's, it's at the upper boundary of what is sustainable, um, we have help. We have our dear friend Juan, who is now kind of like a key member of our group of Sasha and I, and now Juan. Um, and we're doing like a profit sharing model that we're developing as we go. And then we have folks that are volunteering and plugging in in various ways through trade or just to learn and what have you. And so, yeah, uh, in those ways, it, it's, it's, it's evolving and I'm also trying to be careful that if it's like if, if there's 15 or 20 people and that becomes a burden energetically it's lovely but it's also a lot of like mental space to work with so I don't know that I have a thing to say that we have this is how we do it it's like we're actively in the process of trying to find that balance and in the middle of shipping season in particular but spring in particular but also with fall I can get to a place where it feels like you know, panic attacky, or like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. And mm -hmm. um, there's a week or two where I feel like I'm not sure if I made the right decisions with all this because of the amount of stress and burnt, like pressure of all the things that have to be done, both shipping, but then also the seeds need to get started. And so for folks that are thinking of it as an enterprise, there, it's an important awareness that there is like an specifically perennial plant nursery work where you're not using season extension, you're not pushing it with inputs, there is extreme amount of density in the late fall going into winter and a profound, nearly crushing amount of density of work that needs to happen just as things thaw out, especially in our climate where it stays really cold and frozen and then gets really warm really fast. That arc is orders of magnitude more dense than some other cropping systems that are out there. But then, then it relaxes and you get like most of the summer to enjoy and pick fruit and collect and do those sorts of things. So I, I really appreciate it. I just, it's something to find that balance for and like prep myself better. Like, so we built a sauna so we can do, like and go do cold yeah. plunges and try to take time off and like do some things that help. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it's intense and and wonderful, but also I should make videos at some point being more real about what those edges feel like. Cause it, it sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, why am I even doing this? But then it, it goes away and then I feel good again. <laughs> yeah. Nice, great answer. Thank you. Um, East Mizzle says, when you get new to you plants and start working with them, is there a sort of grace period before you begin propagating while waiting for fruiting to occur? Is there a species you'd be excited to grow if you could just find it? Hmm. 
That's a great question. Yeah, uh, we tend to be pretty fancy with the plant when they first come in, like a, a carmine gumi I bought in and you know, they're not that common. And so they got like a nice prime spot in the garden and dumped a bunch of leaves around them. And I'm not gonna start hacking at it for cuttings for a little while. We'll let them make fruit and then try to grow those from seed before we start taking body parts to clone from. Yeah. Um, we brought in Mioga ginger, which was purported to be zone seven hardy. And so it was like pretty expensive to get this tiny little fraction of a plant. And so it went in a high tunnel with compost and a tag and all this stuff and then after two years start like putting a little outside and a little over here and a little over there and now five years later we realize Mioga is an absolute like amazing brute of a perennial for zone 5b and so now we can grow it everywhere and sell it at a much much lower price than we got it for but yeah when they first come in and you've got this like 36 dollar fleck of a plant <laughs> It yeah. makes sense to put like, you know, like the fluff, you know, sift the compost and you <laughs> give them like a little sprinkle and you come check on it. Um, and then when they've proven themselves to be really powerfully solid in the landscape, then uh, a, a thoughtful but ever increasing level of roughness can be applied of like, take some cutting, stick them, see what works until eventually you just find the utility and the flow of them as a beast that can be replicated quickly. Most plants, once they're go up and running, they're like really amenable to just rapid increase. That's what they all want to do. Nice. All right. Nicole says, having a difficult time getting the elderberry to take off. Someone told me they are blues, not blacks. So they're, they're not easy to propagate. Two kinds of propagation going and both seem to be a flop so far. Cuttings just stuck in the ground and then water in a jar method. Uh, that's, I think that's Sambucus creulia maybe is the blue elderberry. Uh, if that's the case, um, you can type and say, but I, I don't have any direct experience with them. I can say uh, I've trialed, I've worked with Sambucus nigra, the European types, there's black lace, which is like a fancier cultivar that if I only worked with black lace elderberry, I would think it's the hardest plant on earth to propagate. Every root gets rotten and then they get a weird disease and they die and it's miserable. Um, it could very well be that blue elder is just in that realm of not very comfortable propagating. Strong recommendation would be wherever you are, explore getting some cuttings of something like a Scotia or a Marge or a York, um, Sambucus, Canadensis, some somebody in the like norm, not norm, but the the standard wild lineage of American elderberry, and try hardwood cuttings of those, so you can get your confidence up that like yeah, I stuck ten and nine rooted, and I did nothing other than put them in decent garden soil, and then explore the like the other realms. Uh, other than that, blue elder, I I just I looked into it, but I think it was zone eight or something. It wasn't going to work for our area, and I just was like, oh, too fancy, done. Um, that might just be it. If you, you're propagating something that's a little bit harder, step it back to something easier. So, I, and that's universal with all this. If you're just getting into it and you want to learn cuttings propagation, get some willow and some currants mm -hmm. and elderberry and make it really easy and awesome for yourself. And then try mm -hmm. honeyberry and seaberry and hardy kiwi and other stuff that's cool, but like can really make you feel like you're not good at it for a while. <laughs> So like yeah. have the good stuff. They're like, yay, I'm good at propagating, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And she just followed up with comments. So she had Ni Nigra that she propagated no problem. And she says it has a tree-like presence, not a bush. Yeah. I, that must be the blue. Um, okay. And then finally, someone says, could willows be somehow propagated in a pond? Or could any other plants slash trees slash cuttings? Uh, Willow, I have some direct experience. We'll see how it works in the long term. But I, uh, we we rented a large excavator for our neighbor's spot that I um, alluded to. We're setting up the air prune boxes, and we dug a pretty deep pond. Um, and one of the edges was like a very steep spot. It was like really going to be open to erosion, and so before the water started filling in, I took a bunch of cuttings of Koryanagi and Miabina and some other varietals of willow and stuck them in knowing that they would ultimately be under a foot of water more or less year round when the pond filled. And those are growing beautifully and there's logs and stone, there's 
logs up against them and then stones on top. And that little shallow area that has really shallow water, lots of logs and debris, and then stones that are half in the water and half out, um, held together by the knit of the willow that's rooted into that vertical. Uh, tons of dragonflies and tons of frog reproduction happening in there. So yeah, willow seems to work like stuck straight up in water. Uh, you could also take a bunch of cuttings and put them in the edge of a pond to start the rooting process and then plant them later. If for some reason you can only get cuttings right now and you can only plant in a week, that's something I've done lots of and it works okay. Lovely. All right, y'all, that brings us to the end of our just great interview with Sean. Thank you so much, Sean, for this Q&A. Right. This has been really lovely. And looking in the chat, I see that uh, Stesha dropped a link to Bob Ross with squirrels. So y'all can uh, pull go, up in a window to, to close out your evening with. Um, so thank you guys so much. Let me see. I have something that I'm supposed to say at the end. What is it? Oh, so where can we find Sean? I think that Sasha put the YouTube link in the chat earlier. Um, this recording is going to go up on ASD's YouTube page. Uh, it's also going to go up on Sean, so you can find it in multiple places. Uh, our next webinar is coming up on, Sasha, when's the next one? Can you help me out? <laughs> I'm too, I'm too busy uh, thinking about tree propagation. Give me a second um, and I'll, I'll pop that in. <laughs> it is, I think it's next Thursday. It's Austin Unruh. Uh, we're going to be talking about establishing silvopasture on the cheap. This session is going to be mostly focused on planting into a field as opposed to a woodlot conversion. So just good to know. Um, but we hope that you'll join us. If you would like to see more content like this, feel free to, you know, drop five bucks or, you know, five cents or whatever into the uh, donation at the link. And it will help us keep providing wonderful free content that we love doing. We are a nonprofit, so we are entirely grant and donation funded. So um, I think that's it. I think that is it. There's a link to our YouTube page. And thank you so much, everybody. Um, someone says, Sean, what's the secret word? That's funny. Yeah, some of the videos, if I make a really long video at the end, I'll be like, well, the secret word, if you watch this far, is pumpernickel. Um, well, we'll go with pumpernickel. There you go. If you watch <laughs> to the very end here, you can comment on the YouTube channel, the word pumpernickel. pumpernickel. And we'll, <laughs> you made it an hour and 43 minutes in. <laughs> 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 thanks for sticking around y'all this has been great we appreciate you sean we appreciate you you're, you're a lovely human being we love hearing thank from you. you and seeing what you're up to thanks so and much this is fun yeah have a lovely evening y'all thanks folks okay. good night okay.